Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new webinar of this series of Latin American webinars on physics. My name is Herman Gomez from Universidad Católica de Chile, and I will be your host today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have today another Colombian physicist, Carlos Jaguna from Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics. And uh, uh, Carlos, today, um, we will talk about uh, dark matter, neutrino masses, and late flow violation processes in the scotogenic model. Uh, Carlos received his bachelor's degree in physics from Universidad de Antioquia in Colombia, and his PhD from CISA in Trieste. After postdoc positions in UCLA, in Madrid, uh, at Munster University. Now he is in uh, Heidelberg in the Max Planck Institute for Kernel Physics. Uh, Carlos' talk today uh, is titled uh, Dark Matter, Neutrino Masses, and Lepton Flavor Violation Processes in the Scotogenic Model. And um, well, we are glad to have him speaking today. And we remind all of you that uh, you can write uh, questions, comments uh, using Google Plus Q&A system. Also, you can send us um, comments on YouTube or uh, on Twitter with the hashtag uh, uh, Lau of P. OK? And now um, I let you with um, Carlos. Uh, Hi, Carlos. Hi, Herman. OK, thank you very much, Herman, for the introduction and to the organizers for the invitation to participate in these webinars. Um, so I'm going to share now my screen uh, <clears throat> so that we can have a look at these slides. Next one second. Um, so I guess now you should be seeing my slides. Yeah, now it's okay. Okay. So I will be talking today about um, the scotogenic model, which is a, a model that can account for dark matter and neutrino masses. And as we will see, it has a very rich phenomenology regarding depth of flavor violation. So this work is based on <coughs> mostly on this paper um, written with Avedino in the same. OK, so the motivation for, um, for this work is the fact that <coughs> We know that new physics require to account for neutrino masses and dark matter. Um, where I'm minute I'm having some problems. Okay. So let, give me a second because there seems to be something off. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, let's see. OK, so as I was saying, the motivation for this work is the fact that um, neutrino masses and dark matter <coughs> require new physics. And these are issues, these issues are strongly supported by the data. So these are not uh, random fluctuations. I mean, the evidence, as we know, comes from mostly neutrino oscillations in the case of neutrino masses, and from cosmology and astronomical observations in the case of dark matter. So I'm, don't, I'm not going to go into the details of what this evidence is, but because I know you are familiar with it, but it's very strong. <clears throat> in spite of this, not much is known about dark matter of neutrino masses. So, <clears throat> for example, we don't know what is the origin of the neutrino mass is the mechanism that is behind it, or what are the properties of the dark matter particle? 
things like the mass or the spin or how it interacts with the standard model part. And even though we have some data, it's not clear what uh, the new physics required to account for these issues is. So in the neutrino case, for instance, we do have some measurements of neutrino oscillation parameters, mass square differences, and mixing angles. But this doesn't tell us how the standard model should be extended to account for neutrino masses. And for dark matter, it's even worse because we don't even have matching data, only some bounds. So over the years, there have been many ideas on <clears throat> about solving these issues, I mean, how to extend the standard model to account for neutrino masses and dark matter. So in the case of dark matter, for example, there are ideas based on supersymmetry, universal electro dimensions, and also so-called minimal models. In the case of neutrino masses, there are also different mechanisms that have been postulated to account for them. They include the different realizations of the CISO mechanism, the idea of using loops, the of symmetries, and many others. And as you can see from this partial list, I mean, usually what we have is some extension of the standard model to account for neutrino masses and some other extension to account for dark matter. And one idea that we are going to explore in this talk is the possibility that dark matter and neutrino masses are actually related. But they both come from the same new physics. So not separated, but the same set of fields. So I will be more precise about what this means later, but they are both related. And in addition, they can both be explained by physics on the TV scale. So in some cases, um, neutrino matter sometimes are postulated to come from this is at a very high energy scale, so instead here we are concentrated on the possibility that this happens at the TV scale, which is the, the scale that is currently being probed by the EHC. So the rest of the talk is divided into two parts. Um, first, I will describe what this cotogenic model is, so mostly the phenomenological features. And <coughs> including neutrino masses, dark matter, and so on, electron flavor violating processes. And then I will describe um, our analysis and the main results we got. So, this cotogenic model is a simple model that can account for neutrino masses and dark matter. It's actually quite simple. It contains only two, two new different fields. Um, they are here. So this is one scalar doublet and some fermion symmetries. This model was originally proposed by MA in 2000. And these new fields are assumed to be odd and they are set to symmetry. This symmetry is important to prevent flavor changing neutral currents and also to stabilize the dark. It's not a new model. Um, it has indeed been studied extensively in the literature because it has also a very rich phenomenology regarding dark matter and neutrino masses and also collided physics. Regarding dark matter, in this model, neutrino masses are generated uh, at the one loop level. So the relevant terms are written here. So this will be the power interaction. So this is the interaction between the singlet terms and the scalar doublet. And these are Majorana mass terms for the singlet terms. So notice that these two terms look very much like the, those in the standard CISO, but they are actually quite different. So for instance, this term here is not a Dirac mass term because this is scalar doublet is not the Higgs, and this doesn't acquire a bit. Okay? So this is simply an interaction. That's also the reason why these singlet fermions are not right handed neutrino. So there is no mixing between these singlet fermions and the standard neutrinos. Another important difference with respect to the usual CISO is that these two terms are not, new, are not enough to guarantee violation of left hand number. And the reason is that you can assign to H2 left hand number equal 1 and make and to n, electron number equals 0, and these two terms would be electron number itself. 
and therefore you wouldn't be able to generate these things. It turns out, however, that due to that <coughs> chapter number violation manifests through this other term, which is part of the scala potential, the so-called lambda phi term. Okay. As you see in, in each, in each uh, H2 appears quadratically, so if you assign left hand number, this, this would violate left hand number. Okay. So essentially, the idea is that you need the presence of these three terms in order to generate new three numbers. Only when they, all three are present, left hand number is actually valuable. If you send one of these to zero, then left hand number is missing. So the diagram responsible for neutrino masses is shown in this video. So essentially what you have is neutrinos here, then the single fermions in the loop with the neutron scatters. And these are the Higgs. And the expression for the neutrino masses is well known in the literature. And as expected, it's proportional to the Yukawa, lambda 5, and also to this neutrino and single fermion masses. The same processes that give rise to neutrino masses also induce due to the SU2 symmetry lepton flavor gravitating processes. And some of these are illustrated in this slide. So in this first slide, for example, we show the diagrams contributing to the decay of a lepton into a lighter lepton and a proton. Here, this second line is, is the, the new conversion in nuclei. And here, there are some box contributions to the decay of a lepton into three lighter leptons. Okay. Notice that all these processes are mediated by the charge scalar, so the charge particle that is part of the second of the new Higgs doublet that we introduced, and also by the new singlet. So all these vertices that appear in these diagrams are the new Yukawa interaction. So all these processes depend on the Yukawa, the Yukawa atoms. But since these processes do not violate lepton number, only lepton flavor, they are independent of lambda phi. So they do not depend on lambda phi in contrast to neutron. And in general, we can say that uh, one can obtain observable rates for these processes when the Yukawas are relatively large. So let's say large of order 0.1 or 1, larger than 10 to minus 2 or so, more or less in some cases. So as we will see, this lepton probability processes will play a very important role in our analysis. Regarding dark matter, the lightest single fermion in this model is a dark matter candidate. Remember that it is stable because of this set two symmetry. So the lightest odd particle, the lightest particle odd under the set two symmetry that we impose is stable. So in particular, if it is the lightest single fermion, then it's a good dark matter candidate. And it is lectophilic because it doesn't couple only two levels, it doesn't couple quarks. And this implies that. There are essentially no direct detection bounds, or they are very relaxing, because these processes, direct detection with nuclei, happen only through loops. So regarding dark matter annihilation, well, it annihilates into leptons, and this cross section is proportional to the Yukawa's to the fourth power. Imposing the relic density constraint, so requiring that the relic density of the single fermion amounts to the observed value of the dark matter density implies that one of things that the Yukawas have to be for the one. And this also implies that there is a strong correlation with depth of flavor variability and neutrino masses, because they all depend on the same set of Yukawa atoms. So neutrino masses depend in addition to lambda phi, okay, at left and flavor variation, left and flavor variation processes, and dark matter, they are all determined by the Yukawa copies, and also there is some dependence with the masses of the scalars and the single terms of the new particles that are present in the new. So that's um, basically um, the main feature that I wanted to say about how <coughs> the in this cosmogenic model. So it generates neutrino masses, 
to give rise to lepton free validating processes, and it also has a dark matter candidate. Moreover, there is some relation, we expect some relation between these three issues due to these two Kawa which will enter into all of these effects. <clears throat> so now we go into the second part where I will present the analysis and our results. So an important part of, important motivation to our work was the fact that recently, uh, lepton validating processes are very well constrained and this concern will be significantly improved in the near future. So this table here illustrates some of these processes. So for example, we look at mu e gamma, the present bound is 10 to the minus 13, 5.7, 10 to the minus 13. For other mu e processes like mu 3D is similar, it's 10 to the minus 12. For mu e converter in nuclei, which is around here, is 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 13. So for tau, processes involving tau, leptons, tau decays, so the branching ratio is typically has to be the bound is of order of 10 to the minus 8, so branching ratio is smaller than 10 to the minus 8 are typical, e gamma, mu e gamma, also tau to mu, e mu, that's from here. So it is already very impressive, these bounds, um, and they will be significantly improved in the near future. For many processes, they will be improved by about one order of magnitude, that's the case with mu e gamma, for instance, in this area, and also for tau decays. It goes from 10 to the minus 8 to about 10 to the minus 9. But there are some <coughs> other improvements which are quite remarkable. So in the new 3E, for instance, we will go from 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 16. This is four orders of magnitude. And in the case of the conversion rate in nuclei, we may reach even six orders of magnitude, from 10 to the minus 12 to about 10 to the minus 18. So we wanted to study, even that in this model, where one expects important bounds from lepton field violation, what would be the impact that these new processes would have? Okay. So that was the question that we wanted to answer. So it was already known that mu e gamma in particular provides important constraints. There were many previous words related to this. But as we saw in the previous slide, the major improvement will not be in, in, in new e gamma, but in other processes. So we want to analyze those, and there were <coughs> all these other rates that have been computed recently by Tom and Vicente. But there have been no uh, kind of global analysis so far, studying the parameter space, the different constraints, and the prospects for future detection. And this is exactly what we do. So <coughs> we're studying the parameter space of this model. And Hi, uh, it seems that we miss uh, the audio from Carlos. Uh, Carlos, can you hear us? Okay, well, we are experimenting some issues with the broadcasting with uh, Carlos. And we are working to solve it. Carlos, can, Roberto, can, can you say something? Yeah, it seems that his connection is, is down, so I'm trying to to contact him. 
because it could be that there is a problem with the internet. But we still see his uh, slides. Yes. Yeah, that is strange. Let me just one one second. Yes. One second, just that I'm connect contacting him. Okay. Meanwhile. We want to remind people following the webinars that you can send a question through the Google system, q &A. Also, you can send questions through uh, Twitter. And um, in this lapse of tweaking, if you, you have comments, uh, you, you have time to, to send uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, it seems that he haven't realized that he lost the connection because due to the shared screen. So I'm trying to contact him in a different way. But I hope soon he will resume. So meanwhile, he connect. Uh, during this week, there were some some news about some analysis related with that pattern, in which they were studying the effect of black holes and horizon event with that pattern. I don't know if someone of the of the participants of the webinar have heard about that news. That maybe can comment something. I think we we should uh, stop somewhere uh, because uh, I don't think this is going. Yes, let me just try just in order to call the attention of Carlos. Maybe he's already in the in the <laughs> in the conclusion of the webinar because of the. We haven't realized that there is this, this problem. Thank you. 
just retry again. It seems that he is not he is not connected. So I would suggest to I mean if the host agree to maybe to to stop here the, the the webinar. Uh, we sorry a lot for the for the inconvenience for the for the viewers, and we will try in the next opportunity with the webinar of Carlos. Yeah, sure. Uh, we we need to stop because uh, well, it's it's too long, science line. Then let, let, let's stop here and sorry with the video. Where's